Comments of friends, if we start the uh, start the school, um, the uh, vicissitudes of the uh, Victoria Line notwithstanding, uh, I think we should start somewhere close to our advertised uh, uh, time. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, welcome comrades to uh, this weekend school of hands off the people of Iran. Um, uh, technical uh, technical questions. I think comrades know that the toilets are uh, uh, just on the right out of here. Um, the comments should switch off their mobile phones um, or put them on to vibrate or um, anything that uh, anything that seems appropriate, especially speakers. Yeah. Uh, uh, if there are any technical questions or uh, other questions in the course of the uh, weekend, please see Peter or uh, Tina or myself uh, uh, during the uh, coming uh, couple of days. <laughs> Again, uh, uh, let me welcome comrades. Uh, I think it's strangely appropriate that um, we stumbled across SWPers uh, outside who are apparently attending a sort of education and socialism uh, event. Why you're not there, I have no idea. Um, uh, this is appropriate in a fairly ironic type of way in that uh, the, our comrades from the SWP appear to be saying what is important for the coming period is the question of ideas, is the question of clarity about what the society we're in and what the society we want to see. Absolutely, this is absolutely uh, uh, correct. Uh, Hopi, uh, the ideas that lie behind Hopi, um, have a certain degree of mystification, I think, for some comrades in the movement. We are told at the last AGM of the Soccer War Coalition that the fact that we say that the working class movement in this country, just like the working class movement in Iran, is able to walk and chew gum at the same time, i.e. that it is able to say we are implacably against any imperialist attack on Iran, but at the same time, this is a barbarous regime and we are going to support the people who are trying to overthrow it from below, where, where democracy comes from in that sense, i.e. from mass popular struggles for uh, freedom, for space. Uh, uh, from below, that was quote unquote too complex for people to understand. In the meantime, delegates representing 300,000 uh, members of the PCS uh, didn't seem to find it that complex. Um, at the moment, I, I, I am uh, claiming to be bigger than the Labour Party in terms of Hopi's affiliate membership, uh, at least. Uh, I can't quite draw out masses onto uh, a general strike as of yet. It's just a matter of time, though, I think. Uh, ditto, comrades, uh, comrades of delegates at the ASLEF conference in Nottingham. They didn't find that argument that we can walk and chew gum too complex. Right? There are complexities within these ideas, there are complexities within our analysis of Iranian society, etc. Uh, of course there are. Uh, the moment you go into the most simple ideas, there are complexities. But that principle that we are for those below, we are for democracy from below, we are for socialism, uh, has a resonance, I think, has a profound uh, uh, resonance. When we start to look at those ideas, I think, uh, as far as Hopi is concerned, as internationalists, we have to understand why, for example, Iran is the type of society it is today. It is not because somehow in the DNA of Iranian people, they, they are naturally inclined to theocracy. They are naturally inclined to the denial of their democratic rights. The Iranian revolution in the late 70s was one of the great events of the 20th century, one of the great revolutions of the 20th century. We have to account for how it ended up where it is today, in much the same way, quite frankly, as we have to account for why the American Revolution, which was also a, a tremendous democratic rupture, a tremendous democratic explosion, why it has ended up uh, where it is. Uh, so it's very important, I think, for us to, to start uh, the, the weekend school with a, uh, an analysis, a discussion of uh, an active uh, partisan of that revolution, an active participant in that uh, revolution of, uh, of, of Iran, uh, as I say, one of the great revolutions of the 20th century, uh, Torab Saleh.
Well, thank you, Mark, and greetings to all the comrades. Uh, as you have probably guessed by now, the Iranian Revolution is a complex subject, and I don't think I can do it justice in this short period. Uh, but I try at least to give you some outline, you know, of the history and the background behind the Iranian Revolution. Uh, basically, you could say the Iranian Revolution of 79 was a direct reaction to what was called the Shah's White Revolution, which was from 1960 to 63, a whole series of economic and political and social measures uh, which were introduced by the Shah's regime in the early 60s. Uh, the 79 revolution, you could say, is a direct reaction to that white revolution. But nevertheless, it also has deep historical roots, uh, which go at least as far back as the constitutional revolution of 1906 in Iran. In fact, 1979 revolution is the second revolution we have had in Iran in the last century. Uh, in this period of 70 years or so, of course, Iranian society has undergone enormous changes. Uh, whatever Iran was in 1906, we go back to this, uh, it was definitely not a capitalist country. Uh, and what Iran was in 79 was definitely a capitalist country. So within these 70 years, uh, the entire mode of production had changed. Uh, but nevertheless, the Iranian Revolution of 79 carried all the unresolved tasks of the 1906 Revolution, because the 1906 Revolution was defeated. So I want to give you a sort of brief outline of this history, so that at least we can understand the 79 Revolution a bit better. We've seen at least the Iranian historical context. The 1906 Revolution was uh, very similar to the Russian 1905 revolution. In fact, many of the leaders and thinkers of the Iranian constitution, it was called Iranian Constitutional Revolution, because uh, the demand of the revolution was for a constitutional monarchy, basically. Uh, the Constitutional Revolution was very much, inf as I said, even its leaders and thinkers were very much influenced by the Russian uh, revolution. Because of that, a lot of observers have termed it the Iranian version of a bourgeois democratic revolution. But it is really not in the proper sense of the term a bourgeois democratic revolution. At least I don't agree with that. Because Iran was not a country which was same as Russia uh, in a period of transition from feudalism to capitalism. In Iran, we didn't have feudalism. Iran was an Asiatic mode of production, which had started to disintegrate from, say, late 17th, early 18th century onwards. After the fall of the Safavid Empire, the Asiatic mode of production began to disintegrate. In fact, if you look at the main demands of the revolutionaries in 1906, there were three main, like, you know, your liberty, egalité, you know, uh, we had sort of three slogans in the Iranian revolution, uh, which made the 1906 revolution very famous, which was for freedom, security, and laws. These were the three demands of the revolution. And you can see even these demands are directed against an Asiatic despotic state. Uh, people simply wanted uh, freedom and security from the arms of repression, and also some lawfulness in the whole country, because anywhere in this country there was total lawlessness. Anybody with, you know, uh, any local, you know, warlord or any tribal chief had more or less absolute power over the subjects in that local area. Uh, in fact, in an Asiatic mode of production, in a way, the ruling class is the state itself. Uh, in Asiatic mode of production, the state does not allow any independent ruling class to take shape, any independent ruling class based on private property to take shape because most of the land is actually owned by the state. 
uh, even the merchant class is associated with the state. These are state functionaries. These are not an independent merchant class. But after the fall of the Asiatic mode of production in uh, 17th, early 18th century, a lot of, uh, you know, individuals associated with the state uh, basically take over lands wherever they can. Uh, so the local tax collectors would take over the land, the local tribal chiefs would take over the land in the tribal region, the merchants would now become independent merchants who were now exercising those monopoly rights they had under the Asiatic state now as an independent merchant. So you, and the Shia hierarchy, the religious hierarchy, which was part of the state and it was financed by endowment lands, which they could take the taxes for the upkeep of the Shia hierarchy, actually took over those lands. So all the endowment lands were not taken over by the Shia hierarchy. So we see gradually emergence of layers which are sort of independent of the state. Uh, based on uh, land ownership initially and a small class of merchant class. So when you reach 1906 revolution, this is the sort of class character of the Iranian state. Uh, because of uh, growth of commodity relationships, the state itself is forced to sell a lot of uh, its possessions, as it were, to raise money. Uh, a lot of land, a lot of these sort of uh, merchant monopoly rights were actually sold by the state to individuals, even to foreign concerns to raise cash. Uh, this is a situation we have, say, in early uh, 20th century in Iran. Uh, and the ruling class consists, you still have the Asiatic state, this remnants of this despotic absolutist state, Alongside which you have now independent merchants, independent landlords, hardly any bourgeois class uh, worth mentioning. There is hardly any industry, there is hardly any working class, uh, and uh, basically you could say the most radical layers within the constitutional revolution, which carry the revolution right to the uh, right to its end are basically the urban petty bourgeoisie, the urban petty bourgeoisie, which again itself was uh, not same as you know, say the uh, petty bourgeoisie in Europe, uh, because Iranian cities were not really similar to cities in Europe. They were glorified military barracks, basically, or places on the uh, routes for international trade rather than uh, cities in which some form of exchange took place between the countryside and the city. There was hardly any internal exchange. Villages were more or less self-sufficient and there was hardly any exchange of commodities between the urban areas and the uh, rural areas. So the petty bourgeoisie is itself a new class becoming independent. They were basically servants of the state, producing you know, handicrafts for the army, for the bureaucrat, for the, they were basically paid by the state uh, previously. Now this class had become independent. So this is a picture of Iranian society. The constitutional revolution was in fact successful and the Shah eventually granted and signed the constitution and the first Iranian parliament was actually elected. Then the Russian imperialists you know, objected to this. Uh, at the time the Russian imperialists had a Cossack army in Iran of three, four thousand strong which was sort of backing up the royal guard and you know, was supporting the actual uh, Shah at the time. And this army went on a war pass against the parliament. First they bombed the parliament, then there was two, three years of fighting throughout Iran, uh, which eventually defeated this you know, counter-revolutionary move and re-established parliament. But by 1911, the Cossack army marched onto Tehran, threatening the parliament, either rescind some of the laws they had passed, they had 
rescinded some of the agreements between the Russian imperialists and the Iranian regime and granted few new concessions to American concerns. This was the main objection of the Russian uh, imperialists, that how dare you grant concessions you know, to everybody other than us and our friend the British. Don't forget, by 1907, the British and the Russians had reached some agreement over their rivalry in Central Asia. Uh, so they were now, you know, they signed actually a secret agreement between each other, dividing up Iran to the northern part and the southern part and the middle bit. The north was the area of influence of the Russians, the south was for the British, and the middle was left so that the two can come, and, you know, sort of it was a free zone. It wasn't for the Iranians even, the middle bit, it was just a free zone for the two imperialist powers to actually come and negotiate. So, they were very much interested in weakening the central state uh, so that they can influence it more. More or less Iranian uh, cabinets were elected by the Russian and the British embassy. They would phone each other and say, okay, this is yours, that is mine. They would divide up the, uh, you know, what you could call uh, a cabinet, which is, you know, uh, basically our government at that time. So, we had this period until 1917 when the Russian Revolution took place. After the Russian Revolution, obviously the Russian influence in the north vanished. But the Cossack army remained. The Cossack army, which was sort of influencing northern parts of Iran, remained, and the British took it over. The British paid the soldiers and took over this sort of mercenary army left over in Iran. And they realized, you know, uh, especially after 1921, when there was a, uh, an agreement between Soviet Union and British imperialism, uh, the British basically realized the old policy of weakening the central government in Iran is not going to work uh, against the threat of Bolshevik expansion, uh, what they consider the Bolshevik uh, expansions, because in the northern Iran, in the Gilan province, we actually had a Soviet Republic after 1970. Uh, so they basically organized a coup using the Cossack army uh, to overthrow the Qajar dynasty and bring uh, what was later on called the Pahlavi dynasty. Reza Khan, who later on crowned himself four years later as the new king, was actually an officer in the Cossack army. Because the Cossack army had started recruiting Persian officers to his you know, uh, army corps, and Reza Khan was actually a sort of young, you know, Iranian officer in the Cossack army. Uh, he was the first minister of defense, but then later on he declared himself as the new king, and then we had the Pahlavi dynasty. From now on, this is in 1925 onwards, you have this transformation from above of Iranian society towards a capitalist country, basically. This is a transformation which takes entirely from above. Uh, so we have the first, uh, you could call it a modern nation state established under uh, Pahlavi dynasty in Iran. He tried to sort of uh, appear as if he's a secular modernist, like, a, like you know, the Turkish Ataturk. Uh, if you remember your history, during the war, he became a sort of Hitler sympathizer, and he was sort of making deals and uh, agreements with Hitler's Germany, because uh, Hitler had at the time his eyes on India and therefore Iran was a very major force to actually uh, unite this in order to have that inroad to India. So basically, uh, and also Iran uh, railway, which goes from the Gulf all the way to the Russian border, was needed to carry supplies to the Russian front. So basically the Russians and the British invaded Iran, overthrew Reza Shah, and put his son on the throne. And then after the war finished, we had again a new period of uh, mass activities around nationalization of the oil industries, uh, which ended up in a coup in 53. Uh, CIA organized the coup in 53 and sort of 
defeated the oil nationalization movement and the Shah, which had escaped to Italy, was brought back and placed on the throne. So after that, we have you know few years of consolidating the state, uh, killing all the opposition, etc., etc., until we reach 1960. From 1960, the Shah starts what is called, as I said, the White Revolution. Basically, this you could say was the culminating uh, point in the whole period of transition to capitalism, which had taken place in Iran. As I said, from the time of 1925, Reza Shah's period, uh, to now we are talking 1960-63. Basically, these measures were designed to uh, reduce the power of the merchant class, replace some of the consumer goods which were uh, imported by internal production, uh, and basically carry out a land reform which would release some of the peasant population from the land so that you have what free workers to work in the new industries that were to be created. Uh, behind this policy was a U.S. policy which was an offshoot of the Marshall Plan, you know, sort of an appendix to the Marshall Plan designed for the third world, as it were. In fact, it has started being implemented, this is very funny, by Mossad there before he was overthrown by the same CIA. Uh, in fact, Mossad himself has started putting this plan into operation. Uh, if you check some of the historical documents, a lot of the institutions which actually carried out the White Revolution were actually put into place already by Mossad before he was overthrown. Uh, so this is uh, sort of a policy which was carried out in Southeast Asia, in Latin America, in many different countries. Uh, it's nothing peculiar to Iran. So out of the land reform, therefore, almost, you could say, 40, yeah, 43 percent of the land was distributed. And within this area in which this land distribution took place, almost 40 45% of the peasant population had no, no ties to the land, because before it was some sort of sharecropping communal agreements in the rural areas, which could keep a lot of other you know, families within the sharecropping agreement. Uh, now, whoever had no right to the land was basically dispossessed. So few people were given land, the rest were released from any ties to the land, forced to migrate to the towns. Uh, obviously, at first, uh, this was okay, because the new industries were growing, uh, and from, say, 63 to 73, say, take that 10 years, uh, the working class in Iran had almost increased from 1 million to 3.5 million. Uh, because of all the new industries uh, basically based on producing consumer goods, either directly wholly in Iran or assembly plants for more durable consumer goods like you know, cars, for example. Uh, a lot of it could not be produced in Iran, so they were more or less assembly plants. But certain consumer goods were totally produced in Iran from raw material all the way. So at first this was okay. The population released from the land could be absorbed by the new industries. But gradually this type of industrialization, as you can imagine, reached its limits. Because an industrialization simply based on producing consumer goods has limits of the international uh, market. Because you could not produce in Iran consumer goods which could compete with the same consumer goods in Europe. Uh, World Bank at the time produced this report which proved that in Iran, despite the cheap labor costs, the actual cost of production of the same goods is 30 percent higher than Europe, than European common market. So these goods could not be sold abroad, they could only be sold internally. An internal market gradually reached its limits, it became monopolized, uh, and it reached its limits. So the new industries could grow no longer 
uh, after a short period, this fantastic growth of almost 10% a year uh, suddenly stopped. And we had a huge explosion of uh, shanty towns in Iran. Around every major cities, you had a huge uh, population of migrants from the countryside who could not find jobs, uh, who sort of built little huts around the uh, borders of the town, and they were famous in Iran. The uh, Iranian government called them out of bounds people. These were people who were out of bounds of the city limits. So the city sort of institution felt no responsibility towards them. You didn't have to give them water, electricity, or uh, education, or any of the things for which, you know, they were responsible. They just completely, you know, abandoned all those responsibilities and called them out of bound people. Uh, so basically, you have a situation in which now you have a whole group of new industrial capitalists uh, which have gathered around the royal court, numbering no more than a hundred or so families, who have more or less monopolized totally uh, the Iranian economy by 1975-76. And an economy which is stagnating now, an economy which is no longer growing. Uh, as I said, rates of 10% we had immediately after the land reform. Uh, and these were the first signs of the Iranian revolution that emerged. In 76, we had the first sign. In 1976, these out of bounds people uh, in many cities, especially in Tehran, organized protests, uh, some of which led to, uh, you know, little revolts and clashes with the sort of uh, police. In Tehran itself, in 76, a major one took place in which they had to bring in the army to suppress it. Then later on that year, uh, workers' movement began to sort of show its muscles. This is the first time we see the workers' movement after the White Revolution beginning to go uh, on a strikes. There were sort of yellow unions, official unions. Uh, they went outside of these official unions uh, and sort of a strike committees began to springing up more or less everywhere. And what was very significant about these strikes was as if the people are sensing a mood of, you know, a revolution itself. Uh, workers would win their demands uh, and the management would back down because of the situation that uh, the whole Iranian society was facing at the time. They were on the retreat. But then, as soon as they would achieve their demands, they would go back to work. Two weeks later, they come out again on a strike, demanding even more. Uh, oil workers, for example, is a very good example of this. Oil workers started their first strike uh, by dispute with the local management over demarcation between white collar workers and you know, manual workers. Uh, that was the official reason for the strike. And they won that demand, but a year and a half later, the same workers, having gone through three waves of a strike, they're now demanding a sliding a scale of wages, a sliding a scale of hours, and you know, uh, representation of workers on in parliament. This was in actual their strike demand. So you see, uh, the workers' movement gradually sort of, uh, you know beginning to uh, stretch his muscles and gaining confidence within this two, three year period. In fact, the last four months before the 1979 revolution was marked by a general strike involving almost four million workers and you know, state employees, uh, which lasted for four months. This was what brought the situation for an insurrection to take place. This was uh, otherwise no insurrection would have taken place in Europe. Uh, and we also had a student movement, which was always radical anyway throughout this period. Uh, but the student movement, uh, say at least three years before 79, was coming out in public demonstration calling for the overthrow of the Shah. 
and calling for a general strike to overthrow the Shah. In fact, the concept of general strike to overthrow the Shah was popularized by the student movement, if by anybody else, because no political group at that time was raising this slogan. So you have a revolution which is basically uh, at its core is an anti-capitalist revolution. It's a working class at its core, which is allies, hardly any peasantry involved at this early stage, except via the urban pools, which still had roots to the countryside. Obviously, within this revolution, you see all the bourgeois forces now, you know, trying to manipulate and, you know, gain some sort of influence. Many bourgeois alternatives were offered. Uh, various bourgeois political groups in Iran tried to sort of form coalitions and uh, propose things, but none of them cut any ice with Iranian population, basically. And in 1978, we gradually see the emergence of this so-called religious opposition. I mean, we had this religious opposition before, not as if it was invented, it, it was all, always there. But it was hardly significant. It was not a major force in Iranian politics. Uh, Khomeini himself, you know, every you know, year or so, a couple of tapes of his you know, sermons would appear, you know, but nothing, you know. He, he wasn't the type to issue statements every time a political event took place in Iran. Uh, on most major political issues, he never uttered a word. You know. uh, throughout this period in which he was in exile in uh, Iraq, suddenly this group was brought to the fore. Khomeini, uh, was uh, expelled by Saddam Hussein for doing political activity, which, which is, a, again, in itself quite ridiculous, because Khomeini was actually exiled to Iraq because of his political activity. And all throughout this period, nobody said you shouldn't do any political activity. This is what he was doing. This was his role. But now, suddenly, Saddam Hussein, you know, expelled uh, Khomeini from uh, Iraq, and lo and behold, Giscard the son, you know, the angel of, you know, mercy appeared suddenly on the scene and they took him to France and put him in front of the, you know, mass media. Suddenly they represented this guy as the leader of the Iranian opposition. I mean, we, the Iranians, I mean, we knew about him, we had heard about him, but at that time, honestly, nobody took him serious. Uh, but now it appears there was a whole, you know, machination behind this, you know, manual. For example, it now emerges the uh, religious hierarchy was actually recruited inside Savak, the Iranian secret service, uh, because of his anti-communist, you know, fervor. There was a whole group of them inside the Iranian Savak. Uh, actually, they say Ahmadinejad, who is now our president, is associated with that group which was inside the Iranian Savak under the time of the Shah. This was a group of Islamists who are fervently anti-communist and who believe if we create chaos on this earth, then Mahdi would come and save us all. This is the sort of ideological philosophy. And this it's group was... The, sorry? That's the book on the well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, this is the guy who's sort of, you know, <laughs> build a well in Tehran and people go and drop letters for Imam Mahdi to read and, you know, come out of the bed. Uh, in fact, these, this group, we now know for a fact, not dominate the Iranian pastoral army, the so-called revolutionary guardian army, is actually dominated by individuals and groups and cliques which were earlier associated with that anti-communist wing of the Iranian Savak. So suddenly this article appears in the Iranian press attacking Khomeini and accusing Khomeini of being a communist, of actually allowing this, you know, uh, the communist, meaning the Tudor party, uh, the pro-Soviet Union Tudor party. Uh, Khomeini is taken to uh, North Le Chateau in France, put in front of the mass media, interviews every day, 
any rate, what I'm trying to say is certain forces, as soon as you know, they realize uh, none of these bourgeois alternatives is working against the Iranian revolution, uh, went back to their old allies, which was the Shia hierarchy. Uh, and obviously they brought a section of the Shia hierarchy which had the credentials because it had opposed the Shah. Because the Shia hierarchy opposed the land reform, opposed the 1963 white revolution. Because the land reform would lose them a lot of their so-called endowment lands. And also the merchant class which was closely allied with the uh, Shia hierarchy was losing its rights for you know, importation of certain goods, and because of the import tariffs, uh, they were sort of sidelines by this industrial growth. So these two groups had allied together, and now it emerges that US imperialism, despite the fact that they didn't like this alternative, they actually sat down, negotiated with it, and agreed a transfer of power. Agreed a transfer of power, which uh, was more or less very detailed right to the constitutional draft of the new constitution even. And the uh, USA sent you know, uh, the army generals to actually go and subdue the Iranian army, the Iranian secret services to make the whole establishment fall behind Khomeini. So basically what I'm trying to say is Khomeini's leadership was in fact a type of regime change by imperialism uh, that we are trying to do now. Uh, this is the first one we have, you know, already experienced uh, because they feared the left uh, sort of radicalization of the Iranian revolution. They eventually resorted to their old friends, the Shia hierarchy and the uh, merchant class, which were part of the Iranian ruling class. Which were, as I uh, said earlier, they were part of the Asiatic mode of production, part of the ruling class, which emerged out of the breakup of the Asiatic mode of production. In fact, Shia hierarchy, since the Safavid uh, Empire, was already always a state within the state. It had its own independent source of income. It uh, controlled more or less the entire uh, legal system and the entire educational system. Uh, this uh, group was now uh, more or less placed in power because of the fact that most of the bourgeois forces realized they would lose power altogether. Now, at first, Khomeini, same as in Iraq now. The Islamist groups in Iraq now are not saying we are going to establish an Islamic, you know, uh, theocracy. Uh, at first in Iran, even Khomeini himself didn't say, so, yeah, communists are free, you know, everybody is free, you know, workers are free. You know, he was the most democratic guy you could imagine. Same as in Iraq now. They said, no, 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 we want a democratic Islamic state, you know. Uh, this was the idea which was actually sold to the people in Iran also, uh, that we're going to have a democratic Islamic state. But immediately after the revolution, uh, what the regime did, uh, let me mention another fact. Also, what is interesting, it now emerges a year, year and a half before the Iranian revolution, before the insurrection in February 79, the whole group of leadership of this Shia hierarchy was released from Iranian jails by the same Savak, who six months later was writing in the press saying he's a communist agent, uh, trying to sort of, you know, uh, prop up, you know, political support for this leadership. The same Savak was releasing his associates from jail six months earlier. In fact, one of the guys, Karubi, who was the speaker of the parliament a couple of sessions ago, uh, who is closely associated with British imperialism, uh, he was the guy who set up the committees, the 14 committees in Tehran, which took power immediately after the insurrection. This is the political uh, power that was established in Tehran uh, the day after the insurrection. 
These 14 committees were actually set up by people released by SAVAK a year and a half earlier, before the insurrection. So there is a lot of evidence now to show. Uh, I cannot go into all the details, but there is a lot of evidence to show that when the crunch came, uh, again, imperialism intervened uh, to stop any democratic change, any progressive change, and basically keep the ruling class there in power. Uh, so in 1905, the Russian imperialism intervened to defeat the constitutional revolution. In 1921, the British organized a coup to defeat the mass movement after the Russian revolution. In 1953, the Americans organized the coup to stop the oil nationalization movement against the Shah. And in 1979, again, U.S. imperialism intervened to at least save the day, as it were. Now, this regime, obviously, immediately after the revolution, uh, they hadn't completely consolidated their power. But given the weakness of the Iranian left and its illusion in this leadership, uh, which exists today even uh, in certain parts of Iranian opposition, uh, this group, this regime actually started attacking democratic rights. But that's a sign of a counter-revolution. The first thing a counter-revolution would do is attack those democratic rights gained in the course of the revolution itself. It was very radical in economic demands, say. He was saying, yes, you know, all these great Satans, you know, the sort of foreign capitalists, were now called great Satans rather than foreign capitalists. Uh, we would get rid of them and anybody associated with them, they nationalized everything and uh, the main slogan of the Iranian left at the time was nationalized imperialist capital, of, of which there were only 6-7% in Iran at the time. Instead of concentrating in the area in which the counter-revolution is consolidating its power by taking back all the democratic gains uh, of the masses in the course of the revolution, they concentrated on this woolly, wishy-washy, you know, anti-imperialist slogans which had absolutely no meaning, uh, no even material meaning. Uh, for example, I'll give you one example. Japanese at the time were building a steel industry in the south. Uh, they had already taken four billion dollars from the Iranian state to actually uh, start this project. And as soon as, you know, few people, they, we know for a fact, they themselves provoked people, workers, in the factory to go on a strike, then they said, okay, we pack our bags and go. So they basically, you know, took four billion dollars without delivering anything. So a lot of these foreign firms were actually, you know, loving this. You know, they were, you know, withdrawing from Iran and saying, okay, you now have to pay even compensation to us. That's what the excuse the U.S. imperialism used eventually to seize 20 billion dollars of Iranian money, which is still, you know, uh, not given back to you. Know. So basically, instead of appreciating the counter-revolutionary character of this regime, a lot of the Iranian left more or less either collaborated with it or apologized for it or didn't do the right thing, didn't do the right opposition, didn't oppose it on the right uh, sort of demands, it opposed it in an area in which you know, we were already uh, much weaker than what the uh, mullahs themselves were saying. The mullahs themselves were a lot more radical against you know, the great Satan than you know, the Iranian left was. Uh, so basically, within a year, year and a half, uh, the counter-revolution consolidated itself, uh, it overthrew all the so-called liberal wings within the Islamic opposition. It more or less purged, you know, all the other currents. And uh, what you see today is basically more or less the same uh, clique which took over power in, by 1981. By 1981, basically the Iranian revolution was completely defeated 
and this new regime had consolidated this place. Uh, so this, what I want uh, to sort of emphasize is basically what has happened, uh, the two layers, the Shia hierarchy, uh, the merchant class, and don't forget, together these two groups are also the biggest landlords in Iran, because as I said, Iran is, was an Asiatic mode of production. Don't think in terms of European categories when I say merchants, landlords, you know. Uh, these are all the same. Everybody after the breakup of the Asiatic state tried to grab a piece of the action, as it were, uh, grab whatever they can, land, you know, uh, trade rights, whatever. Yeah. Uh, tribal rights, uh, so they're all together, more or less. They're part of the Iranian ruling class, which was sort of pushed aside by the Shah's White Revolution. The Shah's White Revolution, socially and economically, tried to push them aside. But in fact, because of exactly the same capitalist growth that took place in 63 onwards in Iran, these layers became very rich also. A lot of so-called land which was distributed and sold for cash, the state paid compensation, they had loads of money. You had these guys in the Tehrani Bazaar sitting in a little hut who could lend you 500 million you know, dollars from, you know, on, you know, they had that type of m money, but second-class citizens in their own, you know, uh, country as it were. They were part of the ruling class, which was actually not richer than before, precisely because of the growth in the capitalist economy, but uh, turned into second-class citizens. So these two groups have now taken over poverty. It's, to me, also, a pro-imperialist, capitalist, industrialist class is reactionary enough. These are even more reactionary than those two groups. This is what you have to bear in mind. Uh, a lot of the opposition of these groups to imperialism is not anti-imperialist opposition. Uh, they really had their eyes on the state. They wanted to take over the state, because the state in Iran is still the most powerful instrument within the Iranian society. It has the biggest economic resources under its command. Uh, despite the fact that we now have a capitalist mode of production, the state probably owns more than three, four times all the private capitalists put together. Uh, has uh, its hand on a lot more resources uh, than the private sort of capitalists uh, altogether. So basically they just simply wanted to take the state and they have turned Iran now into what I would call a merchant's republic in which there are, for example, you know, workers in sugarcane, half tap of sugarcane, you have heard in Hopi's literature, been on a strike. Now, merchants in the bazaar have already bought the next six years of Iranian sugar soap, you know, consumption. The hoarding sugar for the next six years, whilst, you know, Iranian factories are being shut down and, you know, uh, basically, despite the fact that in absolute terms, Iranian working class has uh, increased in numbers since 19... Uh, 79. Uh, we now have about 6 million as opposed to about 3.5-4 million at that time. But this is relative, but its relative position has weakened in Iranian society. You now have a much bigger sort of uh, petty bourgeois class in Iran than you had before. Uh, and uh, a lot of, you know, the except few major industries in which the regime does not allow any, you know, even a fly to fly, you know, uh, in the small industries, the regime doesn't even mind if you go on a strike. A lot of these factories, they would rather, you know, sell the factory and get the land and build, you know, something else on it, because the price of the land is, you know, uh, much bigger than the, uh, 
next 10 year profits of you know uh, that capital is concerned so a lot of privatization now in Iran is not designed as privatization in the Western sense. It's actually privatization to turn the factory into a bloody uh, tower complex or, you know, a housing complex or that type, or sell the land, basically. So we have a situation now in Iran in which we have a capitalist state. The state hasn't changed. That was the role of the Shia hierarchy and the merchant class to actually safeguard the bourgeois state in it. We have a bourgeois state, but it's a bourgeois state in a very peculiar way, ruled by uh, mullahs and merchants who don't really want capitalism all that much, <laughs> you know, who, who rather, you know, just buy goods and sell them, you know, and just, you know, uh, quick profit on the uh, back of the oil revenues that they already have, and thanks to Mr. Bush, it has now quadrupled, you know, in Iranian uh, economy. So basically, we now have this situation in which this uh, totally backward, uh, counter revolutionary uh, class which associated really with Iran's Asiatic past is now running a capitalist state. Uh, obviously, there are contradictions. Uh, you know, within uh, our understanding of the concept of the state, you have to distinguish between a political regime and the state as a whole. Uh, a political regime can be temporary, can change. You know, within capitalism, you can have fascism, you can have parliamentary democracy, you can have police state, you can have all forms of regimes, political regimes. Depending on balance of forces and historical periods, these governments can actually change to the degree in which they actually become in contradiction with the state. Imagine, for example, if in, uh, during the period of coming turn, if the slogan of workers and peasants government, which was uh, the sort of a slogan for the United Front, was successful. In fact, there is an article in which uh, Lenin argues this, that uh, if such a government comes into being, it would be in contradiction with the bourgeois state, because it would have to mobilize the masses for the actual, you know, disruption of that state. That would be the logic. So you can actually reach situations in which the government becomes in contradiction with the state. In Iran, we have a situation like that. Not as strong as what I suggested about the 1921, but in a way, the layers which are now uh, <coughs> the sort of powerful elements within the Iranian political regime is by no stretch of imagination a normal capitalist government. So there is contradiction between the Iranian bourgeoisie and international bourgeoisie and international capitalism and the Iranian government. The contradiction are very simply this. Basically, the Iranian bourgeoisie and the international bourgeoisie saying, well, thank you very much. We defeated the Iranian revolution. Now go away. We want to come in. And basically, mullahs are saying, no, sorry. You know, we are very happy where we are. And, you know, we are not, you know. And this is the nature of the Shia hierarchy. I mean, in Iran, I've used this proverb many times. In Iranian proverb, we have a thing saying, you never get back anything from a mullah. You know, you never lend anything to a mullah because you never get it back. You know. uh, and in fact, this is what has happened. The bourgeoisie relied on the mullahs uh, to save it in its hour of need. And now the mullahs are saying, no, thank you very much. You know, we enjoy this very much. We are not giving it back. Even if we have to destroy the whole of Middle East, we are not giving it back. Uh, so this is uh, more or less the situation we are facing now. But over the last four or five years, we have a new upsurge in the mass movement. You see this, again, there are many signs of this. Uh, within the student movement, within the women's movement, within the national minorities movement, and especially now within the workers' movement. Because the workers' movement have now more or less en masse 
broken away from the Islamic workers' organization and are fighting for independent workers' organization. Where this would lead to uh, is obviously still you know, not decided, depends a lot on uh, the Iranian left, what they would do in the next period. Uh, but we are facing a situation in which signs of a new upsurge in the mass movement are beginning to appear. In fact, the whole uh, you know, campaign around uh, the issue of the war is related to that. One of the ways in which the Iranian regime is actually right now uh, suppressing the mass movement is because of this threat of war. So workers leaders are arrested uh, for endangering Iranian national security. <laughs> but, uh, Osan Lu, whose picture is here, is arrested because he's apparently accused of helping the Velvet Revolution, the USA's Velvet Revolution. So basically we have a situation in which the Iranian regime is using the threat of war to actually suppress the mass movement and stop the new revolution from you know, beginning to take shape. And precisely because of that, it is so vital that uh, we never forget uh, the character of this regime and the opposition to it by the masses of the Iranian workers, peasants, women, the students, national minorities, and uh, don't fall.